Super Punch-Out! has garnered a reputation as one of the most random speedruns out there. Of course, there's still a broad skill set needed. Precise timing, quick reactions, and an ability to adapt on the fly. But even when you do everything right, a fighter can throw the run in the garbage whenever he pleases. How do you deal with that much randomness in the speedrun? Well, the world record holders in Super Punch-Out! have figured out a way. And over the past decade, they've been able to beat it and drive the record down lower and lower. This is the history of Super Punch-Out! World Records. Here's a timeline of the Super Punch-Out! single segment record. It's not filled in yet, but we'll get it there. A single segment run is essentially playing through the whole game and adding up the in-game time of all fights. There are 16 boxers in Super Punch-Out!, divided into 4 circuits, so a single segment run consists of the total time of all 16 fights. Now, Super Punch-Out! is a bit different than runs I've covered before. It is quite literally a gauntlet of RNG. You have to make it through all 16 fights relatively unscathed from bad luck to complete a good run. The fights range from non-random to can kill your run with one foul swoop. And of course, you have to execute on top of that. If you get good luck but make an execution mistake, your run may be over. Interestingly, the strategies themselves haven't changed that much over the years. Instead, the progression has come from improving execution and getting the RNG gauntlet to better align. And believe me, it has made for some unbelievable stories over the years. But for now, let's go back to December 2012, when a runner completed one of the earliest single segment runs of Super Punch-Out. He's arguably the most well-known punch-out runner in the world today, but back then, he was relatively unknown. His name is Zallard1. Zallard performed his run on Christmas Eve 2012, his first completed single segment run, which also happened to be the world record. Right off the bat, you've got two types of fights in Super Punch-Out, the random ones and the non-random ones. The non-random fights tend to be toward the start of the game, like the first fight, Gabby J. Zallard started by repeatedly punching him in the face. These punches were all buffered, meaning as soon as one was thrown, he held the buttons for the next so it would come out on the first frame possible. These face punches served two purposes. First, they helped fill the super meter, seen here at the bottom of the screen. Once filled, you can throw super punches that do more damage. And second, they helped fill the dizzy meter, a mechanic abused across all 16 fights in the game. If you punch an opponent a lot in a short period of time, an invisible dizzy meter starts to get filled. Do this enough, and they'll become dizzy and back away. By precisely timing a punch when they come back, they'll get knocked down instantly. This is used across the run to score quick knockdowns, and leads to most opponents being beaten in just seconds. Finally, there was one last step to this fight. A dizzy opponent has that window where they can instantly be knocked down. However, this window can be quite small, and it's easy for even a world-class player to miss. Fortunately, Zallard invented a way around that. Buffer strategies. By chaining a series of inputs together, it's possible to waste the exact number of frames you want so an attack will land on the same frame every time. 
For example, let's say Gabby J's knockdown window is between 120 and 129 frames after the dizzy begins. Well, it just so happens that a full duck, a right body punch, and a high super waste exactly 120 frames. So if you just buffer those inputs together, making each come out on the first frame possible, the super comes out at the perfect time to knock him down. Buffers like this exist on every fight in the game, and help make the dizzy knockdowns much more consistent. Non-random fights like Gabby J are usually pretty simple, but the difficulty level ramps up as the game goes on. Take Aaron Ryan, the ninth fight. The first knockdown is from a dizzy, but when he gets up, you have to precisely time a super to counter his attack and send him down again. Zaller didn't have a buffer to time it, but he nailed it to send him down for the KO. Those fights are non-random or close to it. Others include Piston Hurricane, Mr. Sandman, and Heike Kagero. You get them dizzy and use a buffer to knock them down. Some have tough punches that have to be timed, while others are even simpler. That's the gist of the non-random fights. But then, there are the random fights. These are the fights that more or less define Super Punch-Out as a speed game. Not only do you need to execute properly, that's a given, but you also need to deal with luck. Luck that can range from a golden opportunity to potentially killing a run. Take Dragon Chan, the sixth fight in the game. The first phase of the fight, up until the first knockdown, is simple. You throw a sequence of gut punches, most with a slight delay before them, then use a buffer sequence to send him down. Phase 2, once he's up from the first knockdown, is where the randomness begins. There are three things Dragon Chan can do here. 50% of the time he does kicks, where you have to just dodge out of the way, then use rapid punches to send him down at around 12 seconds. 25% of the time, he does a slow heal, where he stands still and tries to heal his health. Two supers send him down, and you get a time in the high 9 second range. And 25% of the time, he does a fast heal, where using just one super gives a time in the high 7s. That's a range of more than 4 seconds for one fight. Given that boxers are beaten in 15 seconds or less, that's a massive time swing. And Dragon Chan is just one example. Zallard had to deal with luck like this on more than half the fights in the game. But we'll get to that later. For now, the sum of his 16 fights came out to 3 minutes and 10 seconds. It was a well-executed run, and had a range of good and bad luck. Over the following few weeks in 2013, Zallard would keep doing attempts and chipping away at the record. He took it lower into the threes, approaching the sub-3 barrier but falling just short. However, on March 19th, thanks to a couple fights in particular, Zallard had a very promising run. This is Bob Charlie. He's a gauntlet of RNG, and being the fifth fight in the game, he's the earliest boxer who can kill a run from randomness alone. Zallard went for the riskiest strategy on Bob, which involves hitting him seven times in the face to get him dizzy. However, he can randomly dodge any of these seven punches, meaning you have to do an additional punch later on to make up for it. He can also dodge that punch. So to get the fastest time on Bob with this strategy, all seven of your punches need to go through, and a super in phase two needs to as well. It can lead to a time in the five second range. However, every dodged punch loses a second and a half. One dodge isn't too bad, but two or three or four dodges? Your time can spiral in a hurry. Luckily for Zallard, on this particular run, Bob only dodged once, so he moved on with a very solid 6.99. Unfortunately, Dragon Chan gave kicks, so he failed to gain much time there. But thanks to some very solid execution down the stretch, 
Zalrod is able to keep it close going into the special circuit. And it was there he had to face off against Hoy Carlo. Hoy is absolutely brutal. He's extremely random, and he's the third to last fight in the game. Not an opportune time for a bunch of RNG. A lot of the first phase of the fight is playing it by ear. You want to throw punches and hit him with supers to get him dizzy. Of course, he can randomly block you, duck under punches, and potentially shove you to the side. If he shoves, it destroys your dizzy meter and can kill your run instantly. In phases 2 and 3, you need to throw supers to knock him down twice more. He can randomly duck under these. Each duck loses about a second and a half, or potentially more depending on his next moves. Now, in theory, if you play it risky and get no blocks, shoves, or ducks, you can beat Hoi in 8 seconds. But good luck with that. The odds in getting it were less than 2%. A 10-12 to 12 second Hoi is very solid, but it can get ugly quickly. If he shoves in phase 1, it can be impossible to beat him in under 20 seconds. As you can imagine, it's awful to have to deal with this at the end of a run. But this time, Zallard got some luck. An 11 second Hoy with no ducks. It put him ahead, and he never looked back. A 254 single segment run. Fantastic execution, great luck, and sub 3 by a mile. In the description, Zallard could only manage one word of analysis. What? With the record being well below 3 minutes, Zallard would take a break from Super Punch-Out runs. He was the only runner in sight of the record. Months passed, and his 254 was just solidified at the top. But as good as that 254 was, Zallard knew he could still squeeze a bit more time out of it. And with all the randomness across the game, in theory, the record could come under 250. So in early 2014, he hopped back on and started doing attempts. On January 23rd, he had a run with an okay start. Two dodges from Bob Charlie, and some mistakes that put him slightly further behind. On Hoy, he got a solid 12 second fight with no ducks, but some bad luck at the end brought the run back to nearly even. In the end, Zallard technically did have himself a new record. Just weeks later, he chipped away a bit more. He had a reasonable pace into the special circuit with time to save. However, he still had to get through Hoi. One, two, yuck, dick. Three dodges. Not exactly ideal. Even so, with time to save at the end, Zallard was able to do it again. Fuck yeah! Another third of a second. <laughs> now, these records were nice and all, but they weren't exactly setting the world on fire. In all, Zallard had lowered the record by 0.75 seconds. He knew he could do more. He continued with attempts and weeks passed, but the game's killer randomness prevented any other records. It was starting to get very frustrating. And then came February 27th, 2014. This was an incredible chance for Zallard. Luck had finally gone his way. His execution had been on point from start to finish, more than 4 seconds ahead of the record. This was a rare opportunity to jump straight to the 240s. But in his way was one more fight, the last fight in the game. And this one was going to be tough, Nick Bruiser. 
Nick Bruiser is the most difficult fight in the run by a long shot. Just as with other fights, your goal is to get Nick dizzy and time a super to knock him down. The best way to get him dizzy is to counter him, then jab him out until the meter is filled and he backs away. Seems simple, right? Well, there's one extra consideration to make. Nick can throw his punch either high or low. There's a 50% chance of each. So you start the fight with two face punches, and then you have to react to which punch he sets up to throw. If Nick drops his gloves down, he's throwing low, and you counter with a body punch. If instead he brings them up high, you counter with a face punch. The window to react to this is just barely within the limits of a human reaction time. You have to see if his gloves are high or low, then send the signal to your hands to throw high or low in time before Nick punches you. If you're playing with any input delay, this is practically impossible. The only way to have a real chance is to play on console with a CRT TV. Now imagine having to do that at the very end of a record-paced run. After all the insane RNG from the first 15 fights. The pressure you're under in a situation like this is enormous. Nick can also switch his guard partway through, starting with his gloves high and bringing them low, or vice versa. You have to react if he does that. And finally, if you do everything properly in phase 1, well, congratulations, you have to do the exact same thing in phase 2, unless he randomly blocks you, in which case you have to get lucky and hope he lets you land two supers in a row. So, Zallard entered Nick Bruiser 4 seconds ahead of the record. If he was going to pull this off, he had to execute the most difficult strategy in the game on one of the best paces he had ever been on. Just don't mess up. <laughs> you gotta be fucking kidding me. Not only did he hit the counter, but he did so on the first frame possible. A frame perfect counter speeds up phase 1 by a fraction of a second and allows for some wiggle room later on. One more phase, and the sub 250 would be his. Oh please, stay down, stay down you motherfucker. Yes! Yes! Fuck yes dude! Get fucked, Super Punch Out! Super Punch Out had just been taken to a new level. A sub 250 was Zallard's ultimate goal, and in dramatic fashion, he had done it. With nobody close to him on the leaderboards, he felt safe to stop running the game. Mission accomplished. Heartbreaking. Nick threw his punch up, but Zallard missed the counter. It was on pace for a mind-boggling 240 with two fights to go, and a 243 into Nick. This wouldn't have beaten the record. It would have obliterated it. Unfortunately, 
landing counters on Nick under pressure is one of the hardest things you can do. And this time, it was just too much for him. But what this run did do was prove how much time was still left to save. He saved almost 7 seconds combined on Bob Charlie and Dragon Chan, with just one dodge and the fast heal respectively. There was also some time to save on Hoi. Getting a time around 10 seconds was reasonable. The real problem was getting all that to line up, then landing counters on Nick knowing what you're about to possibly do. But the potential was there. If not for a 240, then maybe for something more reasonable. On June 3rd, 2015, Zallard had a run that saved the 7 seconds early, but unfortunately, he lost most of that time on Mad Clown. Clown is yet another point of severe RNG in the run. There's a lot that goes into it, but a lot of what to look for is what happens right at the start. You begin by throwing two face punches and hoping they both land. If they do, you're in good shape for later. If he dodges, you're losing about a second, but if he blocks, you lose time there and in phase 2 since he gets a bigger health refill. If both punches land to start the fight, you can beat Clown in as low as 9 seconds. That's the best case scenario. An average, standard Mad Clown fight is in the 12 second range. However, if he really wants to screw around, it can get much worse. And on this particular run, Clown wasn't playing nice and Zallard missed a counter to waste a few seconds. A 16 on Clown is pretty rough, and most of his lead was eliminated. But an 11 on Hoi, and a good Nick fight, was enough for a solid record. <laughs> wow, dude. For real? For real, dude? Just a few days later, Zallard would follow this up with another record, a 244. It was a nice time, but a frustrating run of give and take. He got a 5 on Bob, but it was immediately followed up with kicks on Dragon Chan. He gained several seconds on Clown, but lost a few on Hoi. But really, he was fortunate to get what he did. In Super Punch Out, Every fight from Mad Clown onwards can kill your run just from luck alone. That's six luck gauntlets in a row you have to get through. If one fails, you might have to reset. The game can take an incredible pace and make it look like dirt before you realize what happened. Take this run, June 10th, 2015. Everything was going right. Zallard had managed a 5 on Bob Charlie, a 7 on Dragon Chan from the low heel, and a reasonable 13 on Mad Clown. He was 3.5 seconds ahead, with more time to save later. He just had to make it through the next few fights. This is Super Macho Man, the last fight in the world circuit. Zallard's phase 1 strategy at the time was simple. Start with a gut punch, then counter him a couple times, throw a couple supers, and knock him down in the upper 6 second range. Macho can mess things up if he dances around, but more often than not, you should be good for a knockdown in the upper 6s. However, this fight takes a turn in phase 2. You can get Macho to stay down for the second knockdown but only if this knockdown comes within the following 3 seconds after the first knockdown. So, in this scenario, if your second knockdown comes at 7, 8, or 9 seconds, Macho will stay down for a KO. If it comes at 10 seconds or later, he'll get up and you'll have to knock him down a third time. This mechanic is carried across many fights in the game. So, Zallard had to go for a very quick knockdown in phase 2. He had to throw a low super, counter in the gut, then knock him down with another low super. If Macho moves around at the start, this strategy doesn't work. If Macho does any of his three exercise programs, this strategy doesn't work. 
The only way it works is if Macho stands perfectly still for the whole phase. It's possible, but not very likely. So, what did Macho do this time? It's what I thought. He lost more than 7 seconds. A brutal blow, but the run was still technically alive. Next up, however, was Narciss Prince, the most random fight in the entire game. Honestly, there's too many different things this guy can do to explain here. He can randomly block you, dodge you, give many different patterns, and much more. But he has the same KO mechanic as Macho, where if your second knockdown is within 3 seconds of your first, he typically stays down for good. With maximum cooperation, it's possible to beat Narciss in the 10 to 11 second range, but there's so much that can go wrong. Anything under 15 seconds was considered a pretty good fight, but if Narciss wants to waste time, he can make the KO impossible and essentially kill the run. And what sort of fight do you think he gave Zallard on this run? <laughs> nice. Good shit, Narciss. You're so good. Let's see here, what is that? 21.73? 12 seconds. Nope. Run over. A small mistake, plus a lot of bad luck. In just two fights, one of Zallard's best paces ever was completely destroyed. He had just lost 16 seconds, largely due to no fault of his own. Because, you see, Super Punch-Out does not care about the runner. It doesn't care what pace you're on. It doesn't care how badly you want the record. It doesn't care how well you're playing. It can take away your run whenever it feels. You can be on the run of your life, execute everything perfectly, but if you get bad luck, it's game over. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. So, 244 was where the record stayed. More months went by, with no improvements in sight. Interestingly, in August 2015, a second person managed a sub-3 when Hootie pulled off a 253. But he was far from the record. Still, Zallard at least had a little bit of competition now. In September, Zallard did shave off another couple tenths of a second, but this wasn't the multiple second improvement he knew was possible. But on September 30th, he was gonna have a chance. A second behind the record, with six fights to go, Zallard entered Mad Clown, needing a good fight. He ended up with an 11, easily good enough. On Macho, he got the good luck for a 10 second fight. Narciss didn't mess around too much, and he was able to get the KO at 11 seconds. Suddenly, Zallard was back in the lead. Well, then. Next up was Hoy, who we know can be just awful. But he got no ducks in phases 2 or 3. Yet another 11 second fight. And Zallard was 2 seconds ahead, with 2 fights to go. This run was on pace for a 241, the type of run Zallard had been looking for for years. But, there's one fight I haven't told you about yet. Because Nick Bruiser has a twin brother that comes right before him. This is Rick Bruiser. Rick is a really straightforward fight. There's no luck involved for the first two phases, and the execution isn't too hard either. You get him dizzy in phase one, then use counters and supers in phase two. That stuff's fine, but then there's phase 3. The entire fight is made or broken on the first punch of this phase. If this high super lands, you'll finish the fight at 11 seconds. If it doesn't, you're getting a 16, or in rare cases a 14, but more often than not, it's a 16. That's a 5 second difference, enormous for a game like this. 
Five eighths of the time, the super lands. Three eighths of the time, it does not. That's all there is to it. A little over half the time, Rick Bruiser will let you through, but three times out of eight, he will destroy your run. So, Zallard entered the fight two seconds ahead. A huge opportunity, but he had the threat of a massive time loss hanging over his head. And what did Rick Bruiser do? Well, it's super punch out, late on record pace. What do you think Rick did? He didn't do it. So it's over. The run is dead. No mercy. 244 is where the record would have to stay. Zallard took a break for a few months, but still, there was no real threat to his record. Hootie was still the second place runner, nearly 10 seconds behind. So, in early 2016, Zallard came back for more, praying he could get the last few seconds within his grasp. On April 14th, he had a run slightly behind with four fights to go. He had time to save against a 14 Narciss split, and managed a 13. Hoy was another fight with time to save, and once again he squeezed out a second. So, Zallard was ahead going into Rick Bruiser. If he would just stand still and take the uppercut, he was gonna have a shot at the record. He needed the 5 8 luck. We got it. And he got it. Zallard was now two Nick counters away from a world record. One more. Yes! 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 Finally, Zallard had lowered the record. This wasn't the god run he was looking for. Dragon Chan gave kicks, Clown gave a 12, and the special circuit could have been better, but it was still a 243. After this run, Zallard took a step back not only from Super Punch Out, but from speedrunning as a whole. For a year and a half, he didn't do any runs, giving other runners a serious opportunity to step in and take the record but nobody did. Zallard remained at the top unchallenged, with the closest player still being Hootie. It's quite rare to have records undisputed for this long, but Zallard's mastery of the game was far ahead of anyone else's. Finally, 18 months after his 243, he went back to attempts. It was hard to expect a record right away, since it had been so long since his last attempts. It took some time to get back into it, but he eventually started getting runs deep. Still, nothing good enough for a record. But all of a sudden, on November 29th, 2017, Zallard found himself on this run. This is kind of stupid. Dude, if I get the K- there, There's no way I'm getting the KO, dude. No fucking way, dude. No fucking way. What is this? What is this bullshit? Alright, Rick could totally fucking dodge me, and it could still be okay. I'm gonna miss, dude. I'm gonna miss.
fuck, dude. One of the toughest things to do in speedrunning is executing under pressure. Super Punch-Out may be known for its randomness, but even when the luck aligns, you still have to execute. And if you don't, you're gonna get punished. Fortunately, after years of running the game, Zallard had become quite resilient, and a few months later, he had another run ahead into the special circuit, albeit not quite as far ahead. But suddenly, after managing a 10 on Hoi, the pace became much more serious. A 6 second lead late in the run, just 2 fights to go, a huge chance for redemption, Wanna guess what Rick did in Phase 3? Of course. Still, he led by about a second, and hit the counters on Nick for a small record. That's it. It wasn't what it could have been, but a 242 was still progress made. And on April 26th, he'd make even more progress. A 240.36. Cutting off nearly 2 seconds, this was the biggest improvement he had made to the record in nearly 3 years. But at the end of the run, Zaller didn't sound too happy about it. Give me the unwinnable luck here, please. Please. God fucking damn it, dude. Dude, are you kidding? Why was that? Well, despite the improvement, this run could have been a lot better. On Mr. Sandman, he mistimed a high super to lose 2 seconds. And on Hoi, he lost over a second and a half from a mistimed low super. Had he not made those errors, this run would have finished at an incredible 236. But mistakes were made, and the result was a frustrating world record. Take a look at this timeline. This was all Zallard. He had set 16 records over the course of five and a half years. This sort of thing is very rarely seen in speedrunning. A runner can sometimes dominate for a few years, but for it to continue for this long was pretty special. Zallard had eyes for a run in the 230s, but 240 was a seriously good time. And it was going to have to be good enough as Zallard slowly stopped playing and didn't run the game for months. His 240 remained at the top unchallenged. But suddenly, in 2019, the unthinkable happened. A new contender began rising up the leaderboards. He became the second player to get a time under 250, and suddenly, he was just 5 seconds from the record and he was going to try to do something nobody else had done before. Become the first Super Punch-Out single segment record holder not named Zallard 1. His name was Mystery Man 95. Mystery Man was a seasoned veteran in the Punch-Out series, running Mike Tyson's Punch-Out and holding the record in Punch-Out Wii. These games all require precise timing and rhythm, so it's no wonder he was able to adapt so easily. But there's one other thing to keep in mind about Mystery Man. He played on Wii U Virtual Console, meaning he had a few frames of input delay. Remember how you have to react to Nick Bruiser's guard? That's effectively impossible with input delay. So, Mystery Man had to just guess where Nick's guard would be and not react. This added a huge luck barrier to the end of the game. He'd usually have to correctly guess a 50-50 guard position twice in a row, once in Phase 1 and once in Phase 2. He'd need to do that to have any shot at beating Zaller's record. Fortunately, Mystery Man had some strategies to help on other fights. One was on Bob Charlie. The old strategy involved 7 punches in Phase 1 where Bob could dodge any of them. Instead, he countered Bob on the 5th one and did the rest while stunning him. This cost about a second, 
but made it so that Bob could now only dodge the first four punches rather than all seven. He also did something different on Macho. By delaying phase one slightly to get the knockdown at a seven instead of a six, the KO window shifted up to 10 seconds instead of nine. You could then delay the first punch of phase two so that it intercepts if Macho hops to the side, making a KO possible in more situations. These strategies were both developed by Chambers, and Zaller did use them for his last few records, but not the majority of them. And Hudi had figured out something additional on Macho. Ducking into a left jab, right jab to start phase one to counter Macho if he dances at the start. So, Mystery Man had a chance to really put these strats to use and see what he could do. And in August 2019, with his personal best at 245, he was going to try to close the gap on one attempt. There was a new king of Super Punch-Out, and he had done it by a mile. Mystery Man himself didn't see this coming. A 236 demolished the record. The most incredible part of this run was the special circuit. It set a new standard. A 12 on Narciss was a solid start, but a 9 on Hoi was incredible. He had a perfect phase 1, and just one duck in phase 2. Rick took the uppercut in phase 3, and he landed both counters on Nick. These were the types of special circuits you needed for a world record. You need great luck, and no mistakes. And despite the input delay, despite the massive odds against him, Mystery Man had pulled it off at the end of a run. For the first time ever, the record didn't belong to Zallard 1. Mystery Man had ushered in a new era of Super Punch-Out speedrunning, as slowly, the leaderboard began to expand with more people attaining sub-3s. This was the type of competition Super Punch-Out had been missing for the last several years. By mid-2020, there were 7 runners with a time below 3 minutes. One of those people was known as Stock. Stock had a similar path to Mystery Man, slowly lowering his personal best before settling on a 245. This meant he was still 9 seconds from the record. But in August 2020, he would find himself on a remarkable pace. 10 seconds ahead of his personal best, and a second ahead of the record, going into Rick Bruiser. This was a 235 pace and he was in position to take the record. He just needed Rick to stand still in Phase 3. Fight! He did not. But thanks to his huge lead, Stock still finished with a 239, the second sub-240 ever achieved. Entering 2021, Mystery Man's world record was still on top, but the community was ever-expanding. By February, Two more players had achieved times in the low 240s, Cranklinson and Mr. Mega, and the top of the leaderboard was getting quite crowded. It seemed inevitable that someone was gonna break through. And on February 26th, Cranklinson was gonna have a shot at it. He fell behind early thanks to a dodge from Bob and the slow heal on Dragon Chan. But from there, everything got better a 9 on Clown, a 10 on Macho, and a 9 on Narciss. 
three essentially perfect splits in a row. A 10 on Hoy was easily good enough, and Rick took the uppercut. He was about a second ahead of the record going into Nick Bruiser. But here's the thing, just like Mystery Man, Cranklinson played on Wii U Virtual Console. So he too had to guess on both of Nick's counters. The odds were stacked against him, but all he could do was try. New world record, 235.68. Franklinson had about as close to a perfect second half as possible. Specifically, these three fights were impossible to gain time on, at least with the strategies he was using. The major circuit lost him some time, but when combined with the incredible second half, it was easily good enough for a record. As 2021 continued, the leaderboards became more and more active. By May, Six people had a time in the 230s. As incredible as Zallard's dominance was, he was now in 7th place. The level of luck you needed for a world record run was rapidly increasing. If you got a 12 on Narciss, that suddenly didn't look so good compared to the 9 that was in the record. A few new strategies were worked out, particularly on Narciss, but the biggest one was on Hoy. Cranklins had figured out a new Phase 1 that would ultimately give a higher chance for the 8 second TKO. Those fights would be crucial as the record was approaching the low 230s. In mid-2021, players Murakuma, Mr. Mega, Universe, and Fat Potato Seal would all have runs make it to the final two fights on record pace. Sadly, in Murakuma's case, he made a mistake on Rick. And for the rest, they lost the run to Nick Bruiser. Especially at the end of a run, it was really hard to get everything to align. But players knew there was a little more they could get out of this run. With several people at the top trying, they knew that the god run could happen. A run where everything lines up. But the odds in a run like this were getting very low. At this point, likely one in several hundred. Was anybody going to take it below 235? On September 3rd, 2021, Mr. Mega was doing some record attempts, and he suddenly found himself on an incredible pace. A 6 on Bob, followed by a 7 on Dragon Chan and a 7 on Masked Muscle. Three fights in a row with perfect RNG. So far, this was essentially a perfect run. He lost a bit over a second thanks to a 10 on Clown, and got a 12 on Narciss, but he could easily afford it on this pace. A little over a second ahead going into Hoi, now more than ever, he needed a good fight. An 8 is a perfect time for Hoy. Rick Bruiser led his super through, and Mr. Mega was three and a half seconds ahead into Nick Bruiser. This wasn't just world record pace, this was destroy the world record pace. If there was ever a time to execute on Nick Bruiser, this was it. No pressure. First counter. World record! World record, dude! Are you fucking serious? Holy shit! Holy shit! Holy shit! Two thirty two! Oh my god, I can't move my shit! A huge world record from Mr. Mega. He had just shot himself from fifth to first place. This was the time the community had been looking for for all these years. A run in the low 230s. Good luck nearly everywhere, and nailing it down on Nick Bruiser. It wasn't perfect, but the opportunities for time saves were extremely limited. Super Punch Out had finally gotten the run it deserved. And that's where this video would end. That's where the story would end. 
but it doesn't. Look, I don't switch to first person narration often, but I don't really have words to adequately describe what happened next. Because eight days after Mr. Mega set this record, Fat Potato Seal did one of the craziest things I've ever seen. On screen is the running total of the odds of the run Fat Potato Seal was on. He entered the first major luck barrier in the game, Bob Charlie, and ended up getting a 6. A perfect fight with no dodges or blocks. He then fought Dragon Chan, and once again got perfect luck with the low heal. Masked Muscle also gave the best luck possible. He had gotten perfect luck through the first half of the game. He moved to the second half. On Mad Clown, he got a 9 second fight, the best possible luck. On Macho, he got the KO at 10 seconds, the best possible luck. On Narciss, he got a 9 second KO. Technically a high 8 is possible, but a low 9 is essentially the best possible luck. On Hoi, he got an 8 second TKO, the best possible luck. Then it was time for Rick, and his random uppercut in phase 3. And yes, he got the best possible luck. I've been making these videos for 5 years, and this run, I genuinely don't remember seeing anything like this in any other game. Other than half a second from Narciss, on every single fight with significant RNG swing, he had just gotten perfect luck with his strategies. Not good luck, not great luck, perfect luck. Fat Potato Seal was on a 227 pace into Nick Bruiser. Just imagine the pressure in a situation like this. Knowing this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, your hands start to go numb. You feel your heart beating in your throat. Basic tasks become nearly impossible. And landing counters on Nick Bruiser is anything but a basic task. But he might never see this pace again in his life. It's hard to expect anyone to have actually pulled it off at the end of this run. Even Fat Potato Seal, one of the best players in the world. This situation he was in was unprecedented, and might not be seen again for months, years, or even longer. But still, it's a heartbreaking feeling. It just goes to show, even when Super Punch-Out does give you the luck, it can still punch you right in the face. Over the years, we've seen all sorts of world records. Ones that seemed like they had no chance, ones that were on monster paces, and everything in between. This run's history isn't over yet, and this timeline isn't yet complete. We're just living in a moment of Super Punch-Out's history, and there's still plenty of history left to go. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing and sharing the video with a couple friends. It goes a long way to help. Thanks.